how's it going? So, I have been working toward this goal for many years, and now, as of September 2022, our house is fully electrified, and our family has achieved carbon neutrality. So, on the electrification point specifically, I wanted to kind of give a tour of the house, that way anyone that's interested can see what it looks like when a home that was built in the 1970s is electrified to be completely free of fossil fuels. Gas meter locked. Achievement unlocked. But before I get to that, I do want to acknowledge some important considerations around this topic. And there's a bunch of context here, so if you just want to get to the house tour, go ahead and skip ahead to this timestamp here, and that's where it'll start. But first of all, there's the argument that electrifying buildings actually could result in a net increase in carbon emissions in the short term. For example, someone might make the argument that rather than using all of the energy in natural gas by burning it directly in your home's furnace, if you were to replace that with a heat pump, then you would need to get the energy for that from the grid, where if it's coming from a gas-fired power plant, you're still using gas to come up with your heat for your home, and there's inefficiencies, like when you burn the gas at the power plant to heat water to create steam to turn a turbine, there's inefficiencies there, there's losses in transmission, and so on. And yes, that would be a concern in the short term, until the grid transitions to be sufficiently renewable, but that should be happening much quicker than most people seem to anticipate, as you can see in this graphic here, and there will be a link to this source in the video description. Plus, there's lots of different factors that mitigate those effects, like with the heat pump example specifically, heat pumps use far less energy than furnaces, because they're actually just moving heat around rather than generating it directly. And there's a million different considerations as to the emissions of a typical home versus an electrified building, and I'll leave links to lots of good sources on that kind of thing in the video description as well, but the main takeaway here is that there's one easy way to get around all of that, and it's also a great financial decision, and that is simply to power your electrified home with solar panels. Another legitimate point that people are likely to bring up is that I'm over-concerning myself with my own personal carbon footprint, a concept that was popularized by fossil fuel companies to make average people blame themselves for the climate crisis and distract from making the large-scale systemic changes needed to transition our society away from fossil fuels and achieve true sustainability. If you're unfamiliar, I recommend watching this very entertaining and informative video by my favorite creator, Climate Town. And I couldn't agree more. People should not start with this kind of thing rather than taking much more impactful actions like pushing for governments to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, putting a price on carbon, and instituting a cap-and-trade system, just voting for climate-friendly representatives, and so on. Rest assured, I try and prioritize that type of thing. For example, you can check out this video about when a bunch of other climate activists and I here in Flagstaff, Arizona, convinced our mayor and city council to declare a climate emergency and commit to achieving carbon neutrality for the whole city by 2030. We can put that effort into creating a more equitable world powered by clean energy. That's the inheritance we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. Just in case anybody missed it, I want to say that was 7-0 in support of a climate emergency resolution. Climate Town also has a great video with lots of information and ideas on taking this kind of action, which I'll link right here. But by far the best new target for your cajoling is... Mayors, baby! Mayors have a wild amount of power when it comes to cutting emissions. There's also the point that it's impossible for anyone to completely eliminate their carbon footprint anyway, since using me as an example, just as a function of being an American citizen, a lot of carbon emissions are emitted on my behalf through things like the building and maintenance of roads. That's another great point, and my personal way of addressing that is to use a service like REN to offset the relatively small percentage of my emissions that I haven't been able to eliminate. As a result of reducing my own emissions as much as possible, it cost me less than $50 a month to offset the remaining emissions for my whole household, including my wife and two kids using rent. Which brings me to the last obvious critique. At this point, most people are not going to be able to afford this kind of thing. Again, totally valid point. I am not trying to guilt trip anyone here, and I have to acknowledge that I am incredibly privileged to be in a strong enough financial position to afford all of this, especially considering that the significant cost of making all of these retrofits is actually an investment that will eventually pay for itself in 
month's savings and then just continue saving me a ton of money in the future, putting me in an even better financial position that I do not deserve nearly as much as the vast majority of the world population who are not nearly as fortunate as I am. The good news is that since this stuff is necessary to address the climate crisis, funding is finally starting to come from the federal level to help everyone be able to afford it. It won't be long before falling prices from these technologies maturing in combination with federal subsidies to help cover the cost of electric appliances make it such that when one of your old gas appliances kicks the bucket, replacing it with an electrified version is going to be the cheapest option. In some cases, it may even result in little to no out-of-pocket cost. So what will that look like? Let's get to the tour. So, this house was built in 1977, and my wife and I bought it about four and a half years ago in 2018. And my first big project on the path to full electrification was to install this solar array to power everything. I actually did the installation myself. I purchased the equipment from a company that was called Wholesale Solar, though apparently they've since changed their name to Unbound Solar. And if you have the skill set to do the work yourself, I highly recommend them. This is just over a five kilowatt system, and at the time that cost me roughly $9,000 before getting about 30% of that back as a tax credit, so it was just over $6,000 out of pocket. And the savings on my electric bill in the subsequent four years has almost paid for the entire system at this point. For most people, it's probably more reasonable to hire a company to do the work, in which case it'll be a decent amount pricier and have a longer payback period, but in virtually every case, getting solar is a solid financial decision that'll end up saving you money in the long run, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. So, my next project was to install this 220 volt outlet here in my garage. And we did that when our family first got an electric vehicle, or EV, to be able to charge it here in the garage. That way the vast majority of our transportation would also be powered by solar rather than gasoline. And some people might point out that the production of a new EV creates a bunch of emissions and claim that it's better to just drive your existing internal combustion engine, or ICE, vehicle until it falls apart. And there's some truth to that, but I'll link a good study in the description which shows that an electric vehicle quickly pays back the higher manufacturing phase emissions. An average European EV would pay back after 12,000 miles, and in the USA it would take about 12,500 miles. And that's about a year and a half of driving for the average motorist. Plus, it replaced an almost 10-year-old ICE car that was just added to the used market, so it's not like that old one was just driven straight into a landfill. And while we're on the theme of transportation, I'd also like to highly recommend a cargo e-bike like this one that we have here. This thing is a legitimate car replacement as long as the weather's decent. I can put both my three-year-old and my six-year-old on the back here and zoom around town with practically no effort. Or I can turn the electric assist down and get more of a workout if I want. And when the whole family is going somewhere, my wife will usually take the boys on the e-bike and I do my best to keep up on a regular bike, though they usually leave me in the dust. And we always try and use this as our primary transportation when it's feasible. And as a result, we've put almost a thousand miles on this thing this year alone. Then the EV gets secondary priority, and unfortunately we do still require a second vehicle sometimes since my wife and I both work full time, and it's often not feasible to bike during the winter. Anyway, the next big project was replacing our old 40 gallon tank gas powered water heater with this on demand electric water heater. And this project I did hire out since I'm not great at plumbing and it required installing this new electric sub panel over here. And because of that and the labor of professional plumbers and electricians who weren't familiar with them at the time. This whole project ended up costing us almost $4,000 a few years ago, but they are getting cheaper and more common, so hopefully it'd be less nowadays. Plus, heating our water is now powered by electricity, which we get for free from solar, and so it will eventually pay for itself in savings. And it also uses far less energy since it's not constantly keeping 40 gallons of water at well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Plus, on the other side of this wall here, Behind this panel here, there is a hot water recirculator pump, which does two things. First of all, when it is running, it makes it such that you instantly get hot water anywhere in the house. And second of all, it is plugged into this fancy little gizmo over here. So when you do need hot water, you just come and push the button for however long you're gonna need it, usually just 15 minutes. And then at the end of that, it automatically shuts itself and the hot water heater off, so you're never wasting energy when you don't need the hot water. As long as we're in here, I might as well point out that we were lucky enough to get this electric washer and dryer with the house, so we didn't need to replace a gas dryer. 
And then out here, we bought this electric stove, which I do like a lot. It's so much easier to clean than a gas stove. Plus, we don't have an open flame inside our house. My only regret is going with a relatively traditional electric stove. If I'd known about electric induction stoves at the time, I would have gotten one of those instead. If you haven't already seen it, I highly recommend this Climate Town video on the insanity of gas stoves and the brilliance of induction ones here. And as long as we're in the kitchen, it's not about electrification specifically, but I did want to do a quick aside about food. Hey, Sadie, baby, you want to help me feed the chickens? Yeah. Okay, can you take that? Um, so, out in the backyard here, we have four chickens that we keep in this coop and run over here in the corner. And then we also have compost that I'll get to in a second. The chickens are a great way to get more sustainable eggs. Um, plus, it means we have virtually no um, food waste because anything that's edible whoop, gets fed to the chickens. Oh, yep, there are two eggs. Yep, not right now. But I see somebody will get the other two eggs. Cool. Can you take those inside for me? Yeah. Thanks, bud. And then any food waste that is not edible, we compost in the little compost bin that we built back behind the fence here. We use that compost to fertilize our veggie garden here, and we do our best to produce as much of our own produce as possible. Veggies in the gardens over here, and then um, these are all fruit trees that we have back here. Anyway, heading back inside to finish the tour. So finally, the last project that was just completed a week or so ago was replacing our three decade old gas furnace. But real quick, before I get to that, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the first step that anyone should take is to try and reduce their use of climate control as much as possible. We keep our thermostat here set um, a few degrees below perfect comfort during the winter and just dress warm inside the house and have electric blankets under the fitted sheets and lots of warm blankets and comforters on the beds at night. And then obviously just reverse that kind of logic when it comes to using AC in the summer. And then it's a great idea to have an energy audit uh, done by a professional and implement any suggestions they might give you to better seal and weatherize your home with things like good weather stripping around doors, like you can see here, as well as just more insulation, which is what I'm working on with this stuff back here. Um, and then we were lucky enough that this house came with an attached greenhouse, which is almost always warmer than the house itself. And that allows us to use it as passive heating. During the coldest few months of the year, it often doesn't work because of snow. But for a couple of months in the spring and a couple months in fall, once the temperature in here exceeds the temperature inside the house, this system allows us to use a simple built-in fan to suck warm air from the greenhouse through a filter and a one-way air vent into the ducting of the house, and that makes it such that we often don't need to use the heater at all. But for the winter, when we do need supplemental heat, we've now replaced our old gas furnace with this amazing new heat pump. This is the air handler, which took the place of the old furnace, which would roar so loudly every time it turned on. But this guy is practically silent, especially when the store is closed. And like I mentioned, heat pumps simply pump heat from one place to another rather than generating it. So they use far less energy than furnaces. And you might be thinking, what about when it's below freezing outside? Where is the heat coming from then? And the answer is that there's still plenty of thermal energy in what you'd consider cold air. This condenser unit out here effectively concentrates the relatively little amount of heat in the outside air and pumps it inside. And this technology has come a long way in recent years. This particular system is so good that it's still 100% efficient even at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 27 degrees below freezing or negative 15 degrees Celsius. 
and my father-in-law actually installed the system for us. Big thank you and shout out to K&R Refrigeration in Phoenix. So I don't actually know what this specific system would have cost, but my neighbor and my brother both had very comparable central heat pumps like this installed in the last year, and it sounds like it ran them somewhere around $11,000. But as of 2023, there will be a new federal program that will cover up to $8,000 of the cost of a heat pump replacement of a gas furnace. Plus, here in Flagstaff, and many other places I'm sure, there are similar local incentive programs that would cover even more of the cost. Plus, help cover the cost of things like better insulation and weatherization, other electric appliances, and so on. So, this is obviously the way things are heading for the future, and I could not be more excited. Electrification and renewable energy are a fantastic decision financially and obviously necessary to address the climate crisis. And it's great that these technologies have come so far in recent years, often surpassing the performance of the fossil fuel version, and prices are dropping as these become more mainstream, which should continue through leveraging economies of scale as these become the new standard. And unlike in the past when fossil fuels were subsidized, but the sustainable technologies that don't contribute to the climate crisis weren't, it's awesome that now governments are finally starting to subsidize these options as well. Taken all together, I am so excited that a retrofit like this soon won't be an expensive fight that's just a drop in the bucket, but instead it will be the cheapest option, the new standard, and when all of society starts transitioning to this and renewable energies on the grid, this will transition into being the systemic change that we need to ensure a bright future for our children and grandchildren. I hope some of this has been helpful for you. Feel free to ask questions in the comments and I'll try and answer as many as I can. Thanks for watching. By the way, it's looking like I'll be making a follow-up video going more in depth on the cold weather heat pump, how it performs over the first winter, its energy usage, how much that would cost if it weren't powered by my solar array, how that compares to a gas furnace, and so on. So you can subscribe if you want to be notified when that comes out, or check out this video I made about climate tipping points and why the climate crisis is so much more dire than most people seem to know. Thanks.